Hi, everyone. Happy Friday to you all. And uh, certainly, we appreciate you tuning in here. And it is the latest edition of Maria and Fernando Talking Jersey. You know, you all know who we are. We are the dream team of political commentary here in the Garden State. I am New Jersey's premier journalist, Fernando Uribe, joined by New Jersey's premier advocate, Maria Rodriguez Gregg. What's going on, partner? Nothing much. Just, well, you know, talking to you, I guess, for now until uh, I enjoy the fact that everything is opening today. That's right. We're and, mostly opening. Yes. And, and we'll get to that shortly. And uh, in advance, I just want to say a very happy Mother's Day to everyone tuning in tonight. Obviously, it's uh, the weekend. And to all the moms out there, to you, partner, a great mom in your own right, and to my own mom, yeah. who was in labor for over 12 hours with yours truly. So I love you, mom. I mean, that was a lot of pain to go through without an epidural. And uh, that just shows how courageous my mother is, to say the least. And to my aunt, to my aunts out in Colombia, and to all the moms out there, again, God bless you. Every day should be Mother's Day for everything that you do for us. So, uh, partner, let's dive, Let's just dive right in here. And, um, you know, it. it was reported this week by Insider NJ that the Republican primary debate schedule is set. And uh, there will be two debates, according to ELEC. And it will be on Tuesday, May the 25th and May the 26th. Now, according to Insider Rand J, this year's debates will only involve the Republican candidates um, that were able to raise a sufficient amount of funds to qualify against Democratic incumbent Governor Phil Murphy. Now, the two Republican candidates that have qualified the debates are uh, former Assemblyman Jack Chitterelli out of Somerset County and businessman and perpetual campaigner Hersing out of Atlantic County. Now, the first debate will be held at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, May the 25th, and will be sponsored by New Jersey 101.5 FM uh, in the station's studio in Ewing, right nearby in Trenton. And it will be broadcast live on New Jersey 101.5 FM radio with video streaming on Facebook and YouTube, which is kind of interesting since Bill Spadia just is coming back from a seven-day suspension on YouTube, and I think the entire 101.5 FM page as well. And the second debate will be held on Wednesday, the 26th at 8 p.m. It will be sponsored by NJPBS. It will air live on NJPBS television channels. Why two debates? <laughs> I, just, well, I don't know. Yeah, well, and it'll also be uh, streaming on spotlightnews.org. Uh, the debate will be virtual. Uh, the second one, candidates will not be together in the studio, but will appear via internet transmission from their homes or other locations. The debates will be 60 minutes in length, and the primary election is on June 8th. We'll get to a little bit of a, maybe a wrench in it in a, in a moment. But I just have to say, though, Marie, I mean, you know, this week I – well, last week I got this in the mail for our audience. So it is this humongous flyer, which mm -hmm. like, looks like a poster, you know, that usually yeah. you get at a, uh, you know, Pitbull or the weekend concert, right, whenever we go back to concerts. It's, it's basically a scroll of him saying how much he loves Trump. Well, and I, I don't know. I just think next time he should just put a life-size cutout of himself and Trump together and stuff that in my mailbox. Well, this was pretty interesting because when I looked at my mailbox- I'd this actually was, be amused by that. Yeah, it was like stuffed with the rest of my mail. And I'm like, what is Is this like, is the Postal Service now pro providing a buffer type of envelope for my mail? And then when I opened it up, I said, wow. And I remember last week you, we, you and I talked about it and we were kind of laughing. And again, no disrespect to Hirsch. I mean, I get it. He's trying. But uh, it just seems like that type of flyer is like overkill, Maria. Oh, it's absolute overkill. And it really still tells me nothing about him as a candidate. Well, it does. And I think that's a big problem here. And I, I think it sort of lends itself to a bigger problem because apparently a lot of the hoopla going around these debates is that there's just not one but two. And they're being sponsored by two very different entities. I think we, we can both agree that 101.5 FM uh, is a more right-leaning radio station, probably the only one in the state that broadcast live every day. And then, of mm -hmm. course, PBS in partnership with NJTV and New Jersey Spotlight tends to be part of a more left-leaning type of organization. But it's going to be interesting because, you know, for our audience here, and just a disclaimer, uh, Maria and I have reached out to the other two candidates that apparently the ELEC board did not find suitable in terms of fundraising or whatever else, which include former Se Somerset County freeholder Brian Levine and uh, current pastor and religious figure in the, in the community, uh, Phil Rizzo. And apparently they did not meet the ELEC re requirements. Therefore, they will not be involved in the debates. But just to let our audience know, we are working on trying to get a debate scheduled. Again, based on our, you know, on the rotation here of the show, folks, 
Friday, June 4th, the weekend right before primary day, is would be one of our next shows here between Maria and Fernando talking Jersey. So we're trying to organize a debate with all four of them. We're, you know, there's still some time. We're trying to see who's gonna be receptive, who's there not. Is. But but Maria, I don't know. It just seems like there's some variables here that we're not talking about when it comes to the debates, right? How so? Well, the I mean, would... you're not all debating. Um, the fact that there's uh, just there's two debates between Hirsch and Jack. That's unnecessary. One debate is enough between these two candidates that close to primary election day. Uh, what else is Hirsch uh, or these candidates going to say that they can't convey in one debate for a primary? You're right. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And within, I mean, believe it or not, in like back to back days, seems like really like laborious. It seems like I think kind of exhausting to have back to back debates. I mean, if you're telling me one thing, it's, you know, the 25th, right? Tuesday. And then the following week after Labor Day, I mean, excuse me, Memorial Day, excuse me, where that would seem like a more of a buffer zone for the candidates, but it just seems like one on top of the other. And I don't know, it, it just, I don't like the scheduling of it. Again, maybe I, I'm not privy to conversation that ELEC has with the candidates and the campaigns. I don't know, but it just seems like two consecutive debates in a week, not in a, in a week. I don't know. It just seems a, a little bit like overkill. Well, it's a bit much. I mean, like I said, one debate is needed. Um, I can understand why they have it not as close to primary election day, just because, you know, they want these candidates to be able to campaign. And I'm sure that's what the candidates want as well. But two debates seem unnecessary, but it, it is what it is. I think we're going to see if there's anything more to say besides who has a bigger allegiance to Trump. And that brings me to sort of my next point, because I've been using this terminology off the air for a few days that operators have reached out to me. I mean, I think that way I look at these four candidates. I mean, again, I look at a guy like Brian Levine, a former freeholder, um, you know, a, a policy guy, but again, he's not really resonating, I think, polling at all with any uh, demographic in New Jersey. Uh, he seems like a guy that's probably like the most centrist, maybe. I'm not sure. But then you have, you know, and again, I'm not trying to be inflammatory, but then you have the MAGA maniacs, right? I mean, that's the best way to sort of refer to them, the MAGA maniacs. There are guys that are very MAGA. and. Yeah they're dead set on sort of conveying this MAGA narrative to their campaigns. And then you have Jack Cittarelli, who some people might say, well, he's a rhino or he's a moderate or, or he's a conservative. It seems like there are a lot of Republicans online and also I think in print media that can't make up their mind about Jack Cittarelli. Like, okay, he's a Republican, but what type of Republican is he? He's not Republican enough for you. Like, what does that mean? I'm sort of mystified here. because It's a really diverse crowd here with these four guys. I mean, it's not as diverse. What what you have is you have Republican candidates that are trying to play to the base. You know, it's a primary campaign. And in order to represent the Republican Party in the general election, they have to really drum up the vote of uh, the votes. And they're doing that by really appealing to the right side of the party, really appealing to that Republican base, especially those that were supporters of Trump. However, you know, you do have a general election. And I think what Jack Cittarelli is trying to do is and this is probably what's causing that confusion it's almost like riding the fence you know trying to play to that ultra right crowd but then also trying to stay in the middle or maybe go to the other side to prepare himself for a general election and i think that you know that strategy may work it may affect him in a general i mean either way you know i think that at the end of the day trump is no longer a president and i've said this before and while I understand trying to appeal to the ultra right, we care about issues in New Jersey. And I think maybe that's why none of these candidates are resonating in the way that they hope. Uh, you know, we have issues when it comes to COVID. Yes, everything's reopening, but there were a lot of businesses that were left in the devastation. Um, right now you have, you know, people have concerns about if it's going to come back. People have concerns about budget issues. People have concerns about their kids going back to school full time. Some schools are allowing it. Some aren't. This is something that's affecting parents. Like we have all of these issues that are everyday issues that we care about in New Jersey. And at some point, you know, you're going to have to start campaigning on those issues. And you're also going to have to differentiate yourself and explain why you are better than Phil Murphy, who is our current governor, who right now while there is a dip in polling, is polling at 57%. So yeah. he is still polling fairly high in New Jersey. And this was a poll that was done prior to him reopening, basically reopening the state. And so I think, you know, reopening the state, it was good timing. It was a good strategy. Uh, and it's something that's necessary. People approve of him 
opening up the state now. And I think that those polls are going to continue to stay steady unless, unless these candidates really re, like truly differentiate themselves instead of just saying or fighting each other as to who's the biggest Trump supporter. Listen, you're right on that. And I would argue that, listen, and this is not to be, you know, diminutive of the other campaigns, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, Maria, you know, Jack is going to be the presumptive nominee based on polling, based on all these endorsements. You know, he's been working at this for over three years now. So short of some, I don't know, overwhelming tsunami of disenchanted Republican voters, I mean, it would seem that most likely Jack's going to be the nominee at the morning of June 9th. But I think it sort of lends itself to a bigger question about the fact that, you know, Jack has to sort of distinguish himself. And I get it that there are pockets of the state that are conservative or Trump loyalists. But I think there's a I think there's a portion of the Republican Party in New Jersey that's experiencing Trump fatigue. And I, I would just argue that, again, nothing against Jack, but he's going to have to differentiate himself really quickly because the turnaround time isn't a lot. I mean, once, you know, on the morning of June 9th, that's it. It's going to be full blown general election mode. And Jack has to do things to, again, have them stick against the governor. Thus far, it hasn't worked for him. And I think that's there, a there, I agree. And I, I don't mean to, sorry to interrupt, but there is a Trump fatigue. And the problem with these candidates is they need to create a Murphy fatigue. And none of them are creating a Murphy fatigue. He, again, is pulling at 57%. There was a slight dip, but it's going to stay steady now that things are opening up. You know, they um, there was an increase this past month in uh, Republicans registering to vote and so or registering to be Republicans. And but it was very slight. I think that there's still an opportunity for people, um, for the, the Republicans to galvanize the Republican votes, to appeal to independents. But they have to create a Murphy fatigue. And so far, no candidate has done that. It's just who is Trump's best bud? And, and that's not going to work in the general election. It's just not going to yeah. lie. And that's not going to be enough. And as you mentioned before, it's about meat and potato issues. People want to know that, you know, taxes will go down somehow. Uh, we're hearing reports about possibly replacing the gas tax with a mileage tax. I mean, these are things that that's what you have to tack the governor and the legislature on, not so much, you know, pledging allegiance to the 45th president, which to a lot of Republicans, that's not important anymore. It just isn't. You know, it's 2021. Yeah. They're worried about the state reopening and they're worried about what this governor's doing. So sort of help, helps us transition to the next topic here. As you mentioned, the approval rating, obviously this week, uh, Monmouth University released a poll on Wednesday, as you alluded to, where Governor Phil Murphy in a re-election year is polling at a 50% uh, mark. Now, 35% of the New Jersey survey respondents disapprove of the, of the governor's uh, job performance. Uh, and now, while the governor still maintaining a majority approval, uh, it is, Again, as various outlets have reported, it's a stark decrease uh, from the one he received in April of last year, where he was polling at 71%. And as you mentioned, I think obviously a better poll to look at by Monmouth or any other sort of polling apparatus would probably be sometime in mid to late June, after at least maybe a, a full month after all these provisions have been rolled back concerning COVID. I think that would probably be a better barometer, Maria, to look at the governor's job performance not so much now, but I think probably a month into, you know, New Jersey returning to normalcy. Like, is that fair to say? I agree. I agree. Um, or probably in the fall, but um, after the summer and, and businesses are really able to open up uh, almost to full capacity. Um, but, you know, I think at the it's just it's not that big of a dip. And, you know, when you put it in perspective and you look at past approval ratings, you know, people that were reelected where they sat. I mean, he's in he's in solid footing. There's so much to attack him on. There's so much that Republicans can really, really uh, point at when it comes to his record. But none of it's been sticking. And 57 percent is still really solid. No, it is. And according to Monmouth, uh, they polled 706 New Jersey adults from April 29th uh, until this past May the 4th. And the poll had a margin of 3.7 percentage points. Again, I'm always skeptical of Paul's partner because I don't know who they're polling. I mean, yes, it's 706 adults, but, you know, we've known Monmouth to be not overly biased, but who really knows who these 706 adults are? If you're telling me that there's a consistency there where between it's like conservative or Democrats or whatever, or Republicans or Democrats, conservatives, liberals, whatever, that would seem like probably a better barometer to look at. But I'm always suspect about these polls. I think probably it's a little bit lower, but not too much lower, yeah. like early 50s for the governor. 
You know, maybe, I don't know. Uh, you may be right. Usually these polls are, you know, not as far off as people think um, in, in retrospect. But, you know, when you look at New Jersey as a whole, uh, you know, the fact that there are more registered Democrats than Republicans and independents um, that, I mean, Rep <laughs> the Republicans, I mean, the, the amount of registered Republicans in New Jersey is abysmal. Yeah. Uh, the voter rolls for Democrats have just grown. And so, I mean, when you look at that, I mean, it's kind of not surprising that he still has majority support. You know, yes, you have some people that are very loud in Facebook forums, but that's kind of, you know, doing the whole lawn sign standard of, well, yeah. this candidate has more lawn signs. And we know that doesn't win elections. And that's doesn't indicate anything when it comes to electability and who's going to win. So I think that even if it is in the lower, when you talk about plus or minus, what was it? Three something percentage points, even if you're, you know, a, below 55, okay. But above 50, it's still pretty solid. And that was before everything started opening up. Absolutely. And listen, again, uh, I'm looking forward to some sense of normalcy where, you know, obviously this, the governor this week announced and conveniently, literally days after Governor Cuomo across the river talked about um, rolling back a lot of the uh, COVID restrictions. We're seeing that bar, bar seating will resume uh, in restaurants and bars collectively. Uh, we're seeing much more indoor capacity at gyms and everything else. So it'll be interesting, you know, obviously right before Memorial Day, a lot of people thought it was convenient. A lot of people thought, hey, the governor's got to be smart here in a re-election year to try to make sure that we can get to some sense of reopening the state before Memorial Day, when really that's sort of the kickoff to summer. Uh, so it'll be interesting, again, obviously, um, what happens in the next month or two, again, in terms of COVID rates and everything else. Um, you know, moving on, though, uh, partner, uh, Uncle Dave, you know, our favorite guy at uh, New Jersey Globe. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Dave, um, you know, at the New Jersey Globe this week, published a list of who he felt would be Jack Chiarelli's running mate. Mm -hmm. And I was disappointed. A, I think everyone at home, I speak for everybody, I think watching this tonight, I think I was disappointed that your name wasn't at the top of the list. But I mean, hey, you know, that's uh, sort of the way the crooked crumbles as we, as we talked about off the air. Uh, but Uncle Dave talked about a pretty unique- Well, you know, you have candidates that probably don't want to win a general election. So, you know, well, okay, can you fair say? Enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> Again, according to Uncle Dave here, we're looking at people that he highlighted and sort of, you know, again, folks, you can Google the article for yourself and look at, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but we're looking at former state senator Diane Allen, uh, a former six, you know, term state senator out of Burlington County. Um, he also talked about Senate minority conference leader, Kristen Corrado, uh, also Monmouth County clerk, Christine Giordano Hanlon, in addition to current assemblyman, Ryan Peters. Uh, as well as Assembly Minority Conference Leader Nancy Munoz. Uh, and now this is where it gets interesting. These, this is where we get away, sort of transition away from elected officials or people that have been in the, the establishment to Anthony Gee, a financial services executive and an Army Reserve captain. Also, Barbara Kim Hageman, a U.S. Army, Army veteran who served in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait during Desert Shield and also Desert Storm. Uh, Laura Overdeck, who is married to apparently a uh, big hedge fund manager, apparently her net worth, uh, according to, well, his net worth apparently is $6.5 billion. So I would love to get adopted by the Overdecks tomorrow. Uh, we also have That's lastly, too. Michelle. Yeah, exactly. And lastly, we have Michelle uh, Sirkaka. Uh, yes, yeah, Sirkaka, excuse me. Uh, the president and the CEO of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. So Pretty diverse field that Uncle Dave gave for us. Anybody that stands out for you? You know, I thought the most interesting candidates were the um, the non-elected officials. Um, I thought that they were the most interesting, um, and I was more interested in hearing their story. Um, it, you know, what what they feel that they could do for New Jersey, because you know, let's be honest, there's a reason why we have a lieutenant governor position. Um, we have had a situation where the governor had to go, and so somebody else had to take that spot. So, you know, sometimes we look at it as just a partner, but you know, this is a person that may have to end up governing the state. So while these people have really interesting backgrounds, uh, I'm I'm really interested 
in hearing um, their perspectives uh, when it comes to government policy, how they would govern the state, what solutions that they would want to contribute um, and bring to the table. As far as the elected officials, I really, you know, I don't see Senator Diane Allen coming out of retirement, but she's somebody that was a very uh, bipartisan candidate. Uh, really well respected. It, she, this is somebody from my county, somebody that I heavily respect. Um, I thought Senator Corrado was an interesting pick, but you know, for the most part, um, really mostly it was the non-elected candidates. They have really great backgrounds, really interesting. You know, especially when you have somebody that's, you know, comes from money. You're you're going to need that kind of fundraising uh, support in order to run against somebody like Bill Murphy, who doesn't have to spend for a primary, who's sitting on 7 million. So, I mean, I thought there were, there were some interesting picks and I really like the out of the box picks. Do you think, I mean, obviously I saw a lot of females here uh, on the list. Um, do you think that Jack has to sort of go that route? We know that in 2017, Lieutenant Governor Kim Guadano picked a Latino, he picked uh, she picked, excuse me, uh, Woodcliffe Lake Mayor uh, Carlos Rendo, a Cuban American, and it seems like again, no disrespect, no disrespect to Carlos. I know he watches my shows, so I don't want to sort of seem uh, mean spirited here. But um, a lot of people looked at that pick as not really giving Kim a lot of a boost. Uh, do you think that maybe Jack has to pick someone that overwhelmingly is going to give that boost to him, or is Absolutely. that just? I'm sorry. Absolutely, you're you're running against Murphy. And uh, Sheila Oliver is still on that ticket. Uh, she's somebody that's widely respected. And um, so he absolutely needs to pick somebody that's going to garner interest, support, have the ability to fundraise and really connect with New Jerseyans. Uh, just absolutely. And as far as picking a woman, you know, I know there's gonna be a lot of Republicans. I only care about who's the most qualified. All of them are exceptionally qualified. If anything, I thought, that uh, for the exception of the one out of the box gentleman, I don't remember his name, uh, cause he is absurdly qualified. I think that the women were more qualified than any of the other picks. Uh, they're certainly more qualified than Assemblyman Brian Peters. And I like Assemblyman Brian Peters, but to me, I was even surprised to see him on that list because I just don't see compared to the out of the box candidates and even the women elected officials, I, they are more qualified. So if we're looking for someone that's more qualified, that's going to uh, attract interest and fundraise, I mean, right now, the, the women on that list have it. I'm with you. And again, no disrespect to the Army captain, um, you know, in the Air Reserve. I mean, he's very qualified. I think they all are. Uh, but you, listen, you hit the nail on the head there. I think it has to be someone that is going to bring something to the ticket. And maybe it doesn't have to be an elected official or someone that's been in the establishment. As you mentioned, maybe someone out of the box could definitely help bring, especially independent voters. And I talked about this last night on my Insider NJ podcast, Maria, when I was breaking down stats with an assembly candidate out of the 18th legislative district. But, you know, going back to four years ago, I mean, we're talking about 35% of registered voters voted in that election. And it's really embarrassing. And despite the fact that, then candidate Phil Murphy outspent Kim Godano by like an obscene amount. He only beat her by a little over 300,000 votes. And then this is the really frustrating part of the dynamic here where, you know, over 3 million people stayed home in 2017. A large portion of that is independence. And I'm going to keep hammering this. And again, if I'm in, an, if I was in a meeting with, with Jack's inner circle, you have to do something. And I'm not trying to say it's full blown, full blown panic mode now. It's it's mid, it's early May, but you're again. You have to give independence a reason. Listen, Kim suffered from two things, and this is just my opinion. A Christie fatigue. Eight years of Chris Christie. Christie wasn't around for the second for the better part of his second term. People were really upset with Chris Christie. They were just tired of him. And at the same time, too, there wasn't a lot of not to say name recognition. She was a lieutenant governor for God's sakes. Very but cool. She had more name recognition than Phil Murphy. Let's be honest. Phil Murphy exactly. barely had any name recognition. He was not the expected candidate. He positioned yep. himself cleverly um, against the other Democrat candidates that had more name ID and appeal. Uh, so, you know, yeah, maybe he barely squeaked by, even though he spent a lot, but he's definitely has name ID right now. And yep. he certainly doesn't have Murphy fatigue. 
like people had Christie fatigue that was, you know, associated to uh, then Lieutenant Governor Kim Hudano. So I don't know. I mean, yeah, you're right. They're, they really, these Republican candidates are really going to have to give a reason, uh, again, whether that's creating Murphy fatigue or really differentiating themselves and picking maybe an LG that is really going to boost their ticket. Uh, but they, they definitely have to do something because we can't really compare who Phil Murphy was and how well he did when he first got elected to now. Yeah. Sure. He can't. He was able to capitalize on a pandemic. And, you know, people are still not looking at the other aspects of his record yet. And with everything opening up, I, I don't know that people are going to scrutinize unless these Republican, can Republican candidates really make them scrutinize the rest of his record. Oh, absolutely. And doing that. Absolutely. And again, I think at the end of the day, you have to find a way to be innovative and resourceful and get 3 million people who sat out four years ago to give them a reason to come back and say vote. Because again, you know, if, if, if that doesn't happen, and again, 35% of registered voters went to the polls. I mean, that's an embarrassing number. It kind of, I think it's more of a testament. If you remember the Star Ledger published an editorial where they didn't endorse anyone and they kind of flatly said, this is a really uninspiring gubernatorial race. And they were right. I don't ever like to say the Star Ledger is right because they're just awful, but I have to give them their due when they said it was just a very uninspiring race. I don't know if I want to use the same word with Jack's campaign just yet, but it could reach that if by the end of the summer, Jack isn't really attacking the governor on things that, like you said, should be sticking, but they're not, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, yeah, I think it's definitely something to uh, keep an eye on. Um, it, speaking of polling, obviously this week, Maria also, aside from the governor's polling with Monmouth University, um, New Jerseyans here, you know, obviously, um, at, especially the federal representatives, um, U, junior U.S. Senator Cory Booker uh, earned a 57% approval rating. Kind of interesting because it just seems like Cory's just sitting around and not really doing much other than, you know, um, really, I mean, I haven't heard of any bills he's introduced or anything else. So it's interesting to see that approval rating. I was surprised that with the senior They just US like his girlfriend. What's that? They just like his girlfriend. Who? Well, she's gone. Rosario Dawson? Or am I, or, really? Or am I he, didn't he post a picture recently um, on May the 4th? Interesting. Okay. I mean, obviously because of her involvement with the Mandalorian. Pictures, I, there is, I swear there are some pictures of her in the background from her involvement in, you know, the Mandalorian. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't see that, but it, it's interesting you bring that up. I'll definitely want to look at that. But what was, what was very peculiar though is senior United States Senator Robert Menendez was only polling at 46% of an approval rating and a 36% disapproval rating while the president um, had a 55% approval rating and a 39% percent disapproval rating among New Jersey voters. Now, also, to no one's surprise, the state legislature got a 47% approval rating, which I think is too high, um, and a 38% disapproval rating. Uh, what do you think of these numbers, starting with the president? Well, I mean, the president, <laughs> it remains to be seen. I know that there were some job numbers that came out, and you know, unemployment is you know, there wasn't much of a budge. I think people were a little more hopeful that there would be uh, more of an improvement there. But, um, you know, it, it's really hard to say because it's so early uh, when it comes to the president. So, I mean, you know, of course, there's really nothing to really nail him on. And um, I mean, while there are issues to nail him on, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think that it's just so early. Nobody's really thinking of it yet. You know, they're they're just finally relaxing. Uh, from Trump's presidency, um, if that makes sense. I mean, that was a very dramatic turn of events during the election. I think people are just kind of in fatigue right now and not really looking at it just yet. It's just really early. However, when it comes to this, our state elected officials, um, you know, I, it's expected that Senator Menendez doesn't have that high of, a, of an approval rating. I'm I'm actually not surprised at all. There are a lot of people that don't like him and yet still vote for him because of his seniority. Um, but that didn't surprise me. Cory Booker surprised me. I thought yeah. he would have been more in line with Senator Menendez, but it could be because he's keeping his head low. Um, sometimes not making a mistake and not having missteps works in your favor. Yeah. 
you know, um, so even if you're not as proactive in terms of, in, you know, initiating legislation, um, just getting anything done for the state, if you're not messing up either, people are like, well, you know, it's not bad. I don't have anything against them. So sure, I approve. So and, and I've seen that with, you know, some Democrat candidates. They're doing a really great job. They're getting a lot of support because they're in their community and they're not really making any big missteps. Um, as far as the legislature, you know, I'm not surprised. Um, it's too high. <laughs> it is. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I'm not surprised. They're the ones that are originating originating legislation and, you know, the governor signing it. Um, so you would think it would be a little more hand in hand. But, you know, and I, I'm not surprised. Not see you say it's too high, but I'm not surprised in the sense that most people are unaware of who their state legislators are. Mm -hmm. So when you're you know, when I have conversations about what's happening in the state legislature and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the whole of our electorate is ignorant or anything of that nature, but they focus more on federal elections. They focus more on their congressmen and they're not as focused on state legislative issues. And so, you know, I mean, I, I remember, I recall talking with one person and there was a, a specific law that was coming through the legislature and they were mad at their congressman who had nothing to do with this particular legislation. So most people are unaware. So, I mean, I kind of don't know. I mean, I, I wonder when they were polling those people, if they asked them who their state representative is and if they were able to accurately say. I'm with you. And again, maybe I'm being overly analytical here, but with the governor pulling so high and, you know, the legislature at 47 percent, just like, well, they're kind of working hand in hand. Right. Because it's exactly. a Democratic so yeah, you would I think it would be more hand in hand. So while you're detracting and saying that sounds too high, it doesn't make sense. And it seems a bit out of place. But I think that's, again, because most people are really unaware. And this is in many states. And this is I, as somebody that has worked on the government relations side as well, um, mm -hmm. who has you know tried to advocate for issues. A lot of people are truly unaware of their state representatives, who they are and what they do. Absolutely. And I think that that's a really important thing to look at it. When you look at voter turnout, it's usually the worst when it's just state assembly races, when it's state legislative races. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's barely a turnout. So I'm not surprised that the rate, the approval ratings are what they are, because I don't even think people are paying attention. So they're probably just like, meh, they suck. <laughs> you yeah. know? No, you're right. No, you're right about that. And again, as primary day draws near, there are a lot of competitive races legislatively in different districts where some people are being primaried. I mean, for example, I know up here in Hudson County, um, the Republican and Democratic uh, candidates uh, are running on their lines. I mean, there are really no progressive challengers trying to run off the line, uh, at least up here in Hudson County in the three legislative districts. But there are some other districts where you're having some off the line people, right, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side. So that's pretty interesting. So, I mean, we'll definitely we'll talk about the races in a minute. Uh, but, you know, Maria, um, a clock is right twice a day, uh, too. And uh, it seems like, you know, once in a while, Max Pizarro from Insider NJ, you know, who I know I'll piss off my boss by picking on Max because I don't like him at all and he doesn't like me, which is fine. But, um, you know, once in a while, Max, you know, occasionally pens an article that will somehow keep me awake. And um, this week, you know, he talked about uh, some sources he came across that apparently the GOP establishment in New Jersey is, quote, mildly irritated, but they're not scared of her sing as it relates to what type of threat he poses to Jack Cittarelli. And again, just some context here from the article, uh, Insider NJ spoke with several GOP leaders across New Jersey to see if they think the primary race for governor is competitive and they uniformly and blandly offered one word, no, uh, when it pertains to her sing. You know, I'm not surprised about that. And we talked a little bit about it at the beginning of, of the, uh, at the top of the hour, but it just seems that, you know, Hirsch, you know, whether you like him or not, and again, I'm not trying to be disparaging by saying a MAGA maniac, but I mean, that's a good term to use for anyone that's sort of that emphatic about it. But it just seems, I think, that establishment people in New Jersey, especially in the NJGOP, want to really get behind Jack and fundraise for him. It's not going to be easy. They know that. And it just seems that maybe Singh is just being an inconvenience during the election cycle. And I think that's what I'm hearing, too, from people I reached out to. Well... Yes. I mean, Singh is being that 
you know, I think people have to understand um, when it comes to, again, the general election, we, we talk about primaries, but at the end of the day, the person that is going to become the next governor is the person that wins in the general. And that's really the focus. And Phil Murphy, I can guarantee uh, Democrats and Phil Murphy are not afraid of her saying they're not afraid of Phil Rizzo. They're not afraid of Brian Levine. They are more concerned about Jack being the candidate. Um, you know, they think that if anything, he's somebody that could be more effective against them. And so, you know, Republicans strategically are, of course, rallying around the candidate they believe is best positioned to beat uh, Phil Murphy. And people have to understand New Jersey is not a red state by any means. Um, it's not even a purple state. OK, it is a very, very blue state. And yeah. uh, Jack Chiarelli has an experience that seems to resonate better, um, at least they think would be more effective. So, you know, when you have when we talk about the Republicans playing that um, that affiliation to Trump, that's not something that's really going to position themselves, especially if they're not talking about issues that are just our everyday issues. Um, that's not really something that's going to position themselves to win in, in a general election. So, you know, and I mean, Hirsch Singh, part of the reason why he's going to be on that debate stage is because his parents gave him the money. You know, this isn't somebody that was able to garner financial support from uh, a diverse group, you know, um, or get so many small dollar donations to really make him financially competitive in the Republican primary. This is someone that had his father write a check and he has consistently campaigned in many different districts for many different offices and has not won, uh, has not come that close. So, you know, I think that they've seen his past. They've seen how effectively he, how effective he is as a candidate, uh, you know, and based on that track record and the fact that, again, the dollars don't lie. While he may have the money, it's not from a diverse group. It's not from a lot of supporters. And it doesn't indicate that he has a lot of support. So I think it's fair to say that this is somebody that they're not necessarily worried about in the primary campaign. But if they're really if they really are rallying around Jack Chiarelli, I think they should be more worried about positioning him uh, better in a general election. Because, again, you know, none of them are really resonating against Bill Murphy. And I think, you know, pe people would say, well, it's not the general yet, but some of these can uh, candidates have been campaigning for a very long time. So you think yeah. that they would have more name ID. You think they would have resonated a little more. It's not sticking. No, it's not. And it's something that, you know, listen, on the morning of June 9th, I think unless there's some overwhelming silent majority of Republicans that come out, uh, it would seem that Jack Chirrelli is going to be uh, the Republican nominee for governor in 2021. So um, we'll get back to that. We'll get back to politics in a moment, Maria. But uh, a story that uh, caught fire here in New Jersey and actually went national too. Um, a Hopewell, Hopewell, New Jersey Township Police Department has fired an officer who described Black Lives Matter protesters as, quote, terrorists and uh, and will suspend and demote another for replying to a comment on a Facebook post initially um, put down by the officer who was indeed terminated. Now, the fired officer, Sarah Irwin, uh, by the way, not a good optic to fire a woman police officer when you need to sort of, I would, I would, I would say, you know, try to attract more recruiting for female officers. And then Sergeant Mandy Gray, who will be suspended for six months, wow, are exemplary and decorated officers with, quote, absolutely no disciplinary history, according to their lawyer, Frank Trevelli, in a statement released by his law office Monday. The town's actions against them, quote, are disgraceful and cowardice. Now, Gray was the first female officer hired in Hopewell Township and was the first sergeant who was promoted in 2019, a rank that she will lose in the demotion. Uh, Trevelli also said that the, the discipline result is dumbfounding as neither officer had any prior internal affairs complaints. And this was the first such investigation uh, for either. Both are public servants with more than 20 years of service. Uh, Irwin apparently made the post in question in June of 2020. Now it reads as this for our audience who are not familiar. Quote, last night as I left for work, I had my two kids crying for me not to go to work. I don't think I ever felt that way the way I did last night. And then I watched people I know and others I care about going into harm's way. I love my police family like my own. So when you share posts and things on Facebook, 
I'd really appreciate if you think before doing so. And she had thinking capital letters. I've seen so many Black Lives Matter hashtags in these posts just so that you know they are terrorists. They hate my uniform. They don't care if I die. Initially, Erwin and several employees who reacted to the post were investigated and placed on leave. According to the police department at the time, shortly after it was made, then, uh, then police chief Lance Maloney apologized to the community for the post. All right, partner, I I'm going to start off by saying this. And I don't care who I piss off. I talk about this regularly on my Real Talk show, my Insider NJ podcast, and my other shows. I we're living in this time of tribalism, okay? And it just seems like there's this absolutist mentality where as someone who worked in the criminal justice system like I did for 10 years before transitioning to academia and journalism now, okay, I worked in jails. I know what happens with marginalized communities. Okay, I know the struggles of black and brown people. I know people don't think I'm brown because I'm like the whitest Hispanic walking the earth. I get all that, but the, this is the reality. I'm a fan of law enforcement. I support men and women in blue, but I'm also a person that's, in, that's intellectually honest. And I will also say we do need police reform. We do need to sort of revision tactics about de-escalation and everything else. So it's not like uh, either or, that's the thing. And then at the same time, listen, I'm someone who cares about issues that affect people of color. And I'm not just saying this because this isn't a sound braggadocious, but you know, I give a lot of my philanthropic endeavors to helping people of color. Every year I can't be for breast cancer. And newsflash, the women in this country that are most adversely affected by breast cancer are black women. And I bust my ass every year to raise money for, for the American Cancer Society. I care about issues that matter to black people and brown people. I get it. There have been a lot of incidents with police officers that, you know, have targeted black people. We saw what happened. But by the same token, I can care about issues affecting black people, but I'm not going to acquiesce. To BLM, when the when the, when the co-founders of the organization itself, the movement, are Marxists, they're advocating for radical type of narratives and rhetorics. I'm sorry, I wouldn't call them a terrorist, but I'll call them a lot of other things: race hustlers, weaponizing race, whatever. I, I can do both things. I can care about the police and care about police reform. I can care about people of color, but I don't have to put BLM on a pedestal, and I never will. What what? Why is that so hard to figure out? So, you know, I take a different uh, approach to this particular situation in that regardless of, you know, what your opinions are about the BLM movement or this particular officer, you know, when you think of the context and the time, you know, this was somebody that maybe probably felt threatened. And I think that it's understandable to also as you know, community leaders feel like, well, when we're trying to better the relationship between you know this community and police, uh, you know, we talk about community policing as part of reform all the time. Uh, something that was helpful in Camden and in Newark. You know, when you're talking about that, you know, having statements that may seem, uh, you know, uh, I guess divisive, even if it's because somebody's feeling defensive may want to put somebody on alert. So can, I can understand community leaders saying, hey, you know, considering that we're trying to mend the uh, the division and try to bring our community together, this is probably not the best tact. But I don't think that firing this police officer, I, I think that the punishment is extreme for the posts. I think that it could have been very, uh, a, 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 to me, a smarter approach and a better approach if you're really trying to again mend, you know, the the trust and the relationships between law enforcement and the community. The better approach would have been, you know, listen, let's take this post down. Let's have you meet with these groups. Let's have, you know, let's have the roundtable. Let's have the discussion. You know, put this person, you know, you know, when, when somebody, uh, whether it's some sort of, you know just training, uh, just anything to me would have been better, you know, I guess to at least give this person an opportunity to, I guess, maybe rehabilitate or whatever. And rehabilitate is probably not the best word because we're not talking about a drug addict, but rehabilitate that image in the community that, you know, because sometimes there, there are people that have marched for Black Lives Matter that aren't Marxists, that aren't terrorists that really just care about their community. I've seen a lot of these people, you know, I've Senator Testa, who is a Republican, uh, spoke at a BLM protest in Vineland. So to paint 
BLM in broad strokes and that kind of generalization is not the best approach. So in a way, I see both sides. You know, do I think that this, you know, I think that this particular law enforcement officer was probably self-defensive, was probably concerned for their safety when yeah. you consider what's out there in the national media. But then at the same time, like I said, you're trying to mend that relationship. And both groups being divisive doesn't quite mend that relationship. So yeah. this honestly, I think could have been an opportunity to say, okay, clearly you're feeling this way, you're feeling this way. How do we bring this together? How do we create a resolution? How do we hug it out? And I know that sounds silly, but I, I've seen where it works. I've seen where organizations have tried to take additional steps and use these types of situations as opportunities to bring communities together. And I think that that would have been the best tact. I don't think, considering that these people basically had no record, uh, I, I don't think that the post warrants firing. And that's just my opinion. Uh, maybe some sort of disciplinary action, you know, take the post down, but it certainly seems extreme. Uh, and I, I don't think it really, at the end of the day, resolves the issue, which is rebuilding the trust between law enforcement and communities of color. No, listen, all fair points. And again, listen, I don't know who the in-house council is for that municipality. But I'll tell you, I mean, if this is going to be a free speech issue and a free speech type of case, and, you know, Officer Irwin is going to perhaps sue the municipality, I'm assuming that's going to be the next course of action. I just, again, I don't have a law degree, but I don't think it takes one to, to sort of understand that this might be a little bit like just impulsive by the municipality, because it just seems that right now, you know, if it goes to litigation, it seems like, you know, for an officer with that many years of experience and no disciplinary record, um, being an exemplary member of the department to just to be fired for this, you know, unless there's something we don't know about in in, in the, the town. I was just going to say that, you know, I mean, you don't know what kind of um, information was put out there. If there were any mem memos put out, listen, we're, none of our officers are going to talk about this stuff on social media. Yeah. You know, um, we don't know what what was happening behind the scenes. Um, this could have been something that was thoroughly discussed as a no-go. You know, when we talk about freedom of speech, um, freedom of speech doesn't mean you're, you know, free to just say whatever. It doesn't mean freedom of, from consequence. Yeah. So especially, you know, in, in any type of employment. Now, while this is a municipal government, so maybe there is more of a, um, a situation there. I mean, we don't know what the contract was. We don't know if they were already warned to not talk about this issue on social media. So I don't know, but I do still believe that this punishment seems extreme. No, I'm with you. And again, I'm sure we'll have details coming out and filtering out whether or not there were any sort of interdepartmental memorandums, like you mentioned, maybe a, a policy that was just adopted by the department or by the municipality itself uh, regarding employees, right? You know, we see that all the time where municipal employees of any kind perhaps are encouraged in a code of conduct for employees about no social media posts, but it just seems like this is really excessive. And, you know, for, for townships like this, it, it could turn around to bite them, right? Because come litigation time, you know, if this officer wins this case, and again, you're right, you know, I always Tax tell my dollars. Yeah, I always tell my students, you know, the First Amendment, there's a reason why it's the very first amendment, the very first sentence in the document, okay? And yes, it protects you from government being punitive and use your patience against you, it doesn't mean that it gives you the, not freedom, but it doesn't give you sort of like the anonymity to say, well, there's no, there isn't a price for free speech, right? We've seen court cases outline this, right? Supreme Court cases, you can't scream fire in a crowded theater, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not this becomes sort of a blueprint, because again, case in point, there was an officer in Idaho whose TikTok video, now again, it's my understanding that this officer here in New Jersey did this Facebook post off duty. But let's look at sort of like an, a very different example, not to get off topic, but in Idaho, there was an officer in his squad car, I believe on break, who did a TikTok video shortly after the incident in Columbus, Ohio, where the, the, the woman was stabbed, well, the woman who had a knife was shot by the officer. And apparently the police officer, after LeBron James came out and put up a tweet and then re removed it, apparently the officer in his uniform, in his squad car talked, and did it sort of a funny TikTok video like, hey, LeBron, there's two guys of color here looking to stab each other. What should I do since you know everything? And it was funny and all that. And But that department suspended him without pay. 
And now his GoFundMe is at somewhere over $100,000 in donations. But people were saying like, well, wait a minute. Why is this officer being punished? And I get it. Maybe it's apples to oranges. He was in a uniform. He was in his squad car. He was trying to be funny at the expense of LeBron James saying, oh, okay, well, let me ask LeBron what I should do here. Guys, oh, LeBron says, all right, you know what, guys? Go kill. You know what? Go stab yourselves. Have a good day. And he drove off and whatever. It seems funny. But, it, you know, in this climate we're living in when it comes to free speech, especially for people in law enforcement, I, I think that might be disappearing, though, partner. I think we just need to be more innovative and better about how we address these particular issues. I think that at the end of the day, how we're addressing these particular acts, whether it's a civilian or a police officer, uh, isn't really accomplishing any goal or mission of you know, having trust and faith in law enforcement and, uh, you know, bringing these two groups together. I mean, it's really just creating more division. So it's it's just like, we're just punishing everyone, you know, for the sake of existing, but we're still not having real conversations um, about police reform because there are so many great officers out there. But again, you've said it, I've said it, there do, there, there needs to be some reforms. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not really addressing the, the mistrust that people may have. Uh, mm -hmm. and so I, I, you know, I just think it, at the end of the day, we're, we're, what are we doing? We're just like, you know, punishing everyone. We're just doling out punishments and, uh, firing everyone. Everybody's getting in trouble and it's just creating more division and it's kind of getting old. I think we need to start, having opportunities for these, you know, these groups to come together and have real conversations uh, to just basically resolve and make, resolve some of these issues and make our communities better. I mean, we want our community safer. Somebody that's an advocate for domestic violence, uh, we need police officers. We need officers that are well-trained, that are trained in trauma-informed care, that are not abusers themselves, uh, that are going to help maintain the safety of uh, these people that are being um, abused, sexually assaulted, trafficked, uh, mm -hmm. that are going to address crimes, very yeah. real crimes that uh, you know, you know, uh, need the this uh, support of police. So I think you know, uh, we we just have to. I don't know. I guess I'm just flustered because I'm just kind of over it. I'm kind of over the back and forth. You know, we're we're just getting nowhere, and it's just getting stupid. It's just. It, the whole thing is being elevated to absurdity and it's hard to even talk about it in a way that makes sense when none of it makes sense anymore. I'm with you partner. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get over it as well. Uh, listen, the necessity for dialogue, I think is more important than ever. I'm with you on that. Uh, Maria, before we call it a night here, um, obviously some legislative races, we want to just delve into very briefly. Uh, let me just start off by saying that um, I'm, I'm going to have Jamel Holly. Uh, Assemblyman Jamal Holly on my Real Talk show this Monday night live after seven o'clock Eastern time. So for our audience that are looking to tune in on Monday night, you definitely want to tune into that. I'm reading some sort of promising news for Jamal Holly, where I get it. State Senator Joe Crying has you know support from the machine in Union County, but I'm hearing a lot of grassroots mobilization support for Assemblyman Holly. Not so much about the social media, you know, like we've talked about the air, just because you have a bunch of lawn signs and you have a, a lot of likes and views on your Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, doesn't translate to people wanting to go to the polls. But it seems like there's a lot of grassroots noise being made in that district about Assemblyman, you know, Jamal Holly maybe pulling off an upset here on primary day. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean, I think there's actually a lot of candidates that I think might pull out an upset on primary day. I think there's an opportunity for Assemblywoman DeCroach, uh, Assemblywoman DeMeso, and even possibly Holly. I think that some of these candidates are in areas where they really position themselves to um, to win off the line in that, you know, they were constantly communicating with their community, in their community. Um, you know, they, they have that name ID, they have those relationships with their constituents. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they did really great casework. I think that's an, a very important people that, uh, important aspect of being representative that people don't think about. Um, it's, you know, the minutia of helping people, not just creating laws. And so, you know, they, you know, they, they kind of did everything right. And I think that because of whatever power plays are happening on the county level with some of these, you know, county chairs, um, may end up biting them in, in the, 
in the ass later. You know, I mean, I think that there are several races where I, I actually would love to see them win off the line. I think it would be great. I'm I with love you. The competition. No, I'm with you. And I think that's really at the essence here about what you want primary day to be. You want the best person to win, the, the person with the best campaign, the best ground game, the best message. And as you mentioned, whether it's the Croach, whether it's the Maso, uh, whether it's Holly, whether Republicans or Democrats, I mean, you kind of want that competition, that that sort of bland, vanilla, oh, well, it's just the incumbents and there's no one getting primaried. I mean, we see that up here in Hudson County where the Democrats have such a strong stranglehold here on the district offices, you know, there aren't those progressive challengers challenging Democrats, right? Because it seems like progressives are always talking about like, you know, these conservative Democrats or these establishment Democrats, we have to get them out, whatever. It seems like other parts of the state, whether it be down the shore or in South Jersey or even in North Jersey, you know, again, I think that's a, I think it's a breath of fresh air when it comes to campaigning and democracy. And I think that's a good thing. And obviously, you know, we'll keep talking about that in, in, in our next few episodes. But before I let you go, and obviously everyone tonight here, I wanna wish you all, especially all the moms out there, a very happy Mother's Day. I can say at least in our family here in the Uribe Gonzalez household, my mom and my aunt are the backbone of this family. I mean, they give us a lot of laughs, but they keep us on a, on a really straight trajectory. And I'm grateful to my mother and to my aunt for everything that they do for our family. I know Maria, you, you're an exceptional mom. I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, to all the moms out there, we love you. We thank you for watching this show and supporting us. And every day should be Mother's Day uh, for everything that you mean to our families. Maria, uh, I'll give you Can the I last- Can say something? And to those without mothers, I'm sending you hugs and love. I know how it is. And, uh, you know, they're, they're still there looking down at you. So there you go. Absolutely. Well said there, partner. And uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you here for- just like I said, you know, supporting our program and uh, we will be coming back at you in two weeks here on StreamYard via Facebook Live. So right after the show goes off the air, share it on your social media. Tell everyone you know how much you love Maria and Fernando talking Jersey because we're the dream team of political commentary. People are watching us. Some people might deny it, but it's sort of like a guilty pleasure that a lot of politicos in New Jersey have. Trust me, they love this show. So again, on behalf of New Jersey's premier advocate, Maria Rodriguez, Greg, I'm New Jersey's premier journalist, Fernando Uribe, saying so long. Once again, happy Mother's Day to you all. Stay healthy, and we'll talk to you again soon here on Facebook Live.